there and welcome to the Secrets of Organ Playing podcast. I'm your host, Vidas Pinkavichus. Welcome to Secrets of Organ Playing podcast number 121. Today is Sunday, November 19, 2017, and today's guest is an American organist, Carly Leonor and choir conductor Dr. Mark Konuko. Mark has been Carl Leonor at Marquette University since 1999, where he began as interim chorus director in fall of uh, 2010. He holds an MBA from Cardinal Stritch University as well as a Master of Music degree in organ performance from the American Conservatory of Music. He studied Carillon at the University of Utrecht in Amersfoort and has played worldwide in places such as in Netherlands, Belgium and France. In addition to being Carillonor at uh, Marquette, he has an extensive background in vocal music and choir conducting and he teaches courses in music appreciation, business of music, Carillon, discovery and music technology. He also serves as a director of music at the Mother of God Council Catholic Parish in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We met in Vilnius where Mark presented his research uh, on uh, La Nativité cycle by Olivier Messian at the international uh, conference at Lithuanian Academy of Music. In this conversation, we talk about Mark's research about Nativité by Messian and also about his experience playing Carillon. Let's go to the show. Thank you so much, Mark, for joining this conversation. Uh, we've been chatting for a while via email about getting uh, uh, intro- introduced to the largest pipe organ in Lithuania, but apparently you thought about the Cathedral of Vilnius, right? I thought it was the Cathedral, so I went to the Cathedral, and I'm glad we were able to finally connect. Yes, we are sitting now next to the organ bench of Vilnius University St. John's Church, where... Um, where the largest pipe organ in Lithuania is. It's all mechanical and uh, we'll, we'll see in greater detail later. But Mark uh, is here for the conference uh, of contemporary music, of music compositions and all those things in, at Lithuania Academy of Music and Theatre. And just yesterday, Mark uh, gave a presentation about uh, the cycle of Olivia Messian, uh, La Nativité, mm-hmm. right? So uh, I'm very curious to know about your presentation in depth and how it all came about. Thank you so much, Mark. You're very generous. And well, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, the presentation that I did really was uh, based on the themes that were given to us by the people who were running the conference, and that was intuition and uh, rational thought. Uh, versus each other. And in Messian, I don't really see them as verse, versus each other, uh, but really blended beautifully. So I spent a lot of time in the presentation talking about intuition and um, taking kind of a philosophical, philosophical bend uh, with the works of Bergson and Chudnoff and uh, Bacalard. And they all agree, I think, that there is this um, spark, this Ilan Vital, the, the very, very beginning um, that I equated with people's influences and their backgrounds. Messian talks about when he was uh, a child, the, he has memories of being in Grenoble and mm-hmm. how the mountains really affected him. And he has a tremendous love of nature. Um, and of course, we all know bird song and things like that. So I saw those things as really um, food to feed this intuition. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that Messian's um, compositional style is highly rational. There's, of course. It's very, very thought out and um, uh, a, a beautiful blend, I believe, of these modes of limited transposition, the Hindu talas, and uh, all, all this, his uh, elements that he plays with. And there are many of them, Roman Catholicism. So all that kind of was in the presentation, this blend of things. And because 
Nana Tivite is 1934. Yes. It's an early work. And um, it was in that beginning of that collection where he really, in this preface, even before the language of my musical language came out, that treatise, he introduced his modes of limited transposition and said these are the primary th ways that I express my music. You are um, you're referring to the famous treatise by Messia, uh, the, the language of uh, my, of my uh, uh, the the musical language of my composition, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is, of course, translated into multiple languages now. Uh, but uh, at the at the beginning, at the preface of of Latin, Latin Levite, he introduces those modes, right? right? Yes, that's the first time that really appears. Mm -hmm. And uh, he analyzes in greater details uh, in his book, right? Mm -hmm. uh, entire entire technique uh, that is behind uh, his style. So, Mark, uh, how did you first fall in love with Messian organ and uh, and even Carillon, right? Well, that, yes, that's a great that's a great question. What uh, came first? Uh, the accordion. Accordion. <laughs> <laughs> the accordion was my first uh, instrument. Okay. And from the accordion, I remember playing Toccata and Fugue in D minor of Bach on the accordion when I Excellent. was a child. Uh, I asked the parish organist if he would teach me to play the organ. I immediately wanted to play the organ. He goes, well, you know you need seven or more years of piano, piano. before. And, mm -hmm. and I don't know if I started to cry or something, but he said, oh, okay, I'll teach you the organ. So I went directly to the, the organ and um, have been playing ever since I was in sixth grade, uh, playing at mass as a prelude or a postlude or a hymn. And I've been doing it ever since. Mm -hmm, so it's mm -hmm. been um, quite a while, 40 plus years. Well, what fascina fascinated you about the organ? Magnificence, mystery, technical challenges inside it? Um, I think, and it's the same answer for what brought me to Messia, what brought me to the Carillon. Um, on a very visceral level, mm -hmm. the sound. The sound. There was something about the sound of the organ, the flues, the diapasons, the reeds, the strings, that really resonated with me. Mm -hmm. uh, what brought me to Messian was when I first heard it, uh, I think it was Le Corgorilleux that I first heard, um, that just was so exciting for me. So I asked my teacher, could I play this? And he said, oh, it's, it's a little advanced, it's a little... But again, I had wonderful teachers. Um, they started me on this slow process of, you know, from the Celestial Banquet mm -hmm. to this... Uh, so finally, I got to these larger works. Um, and it was really by playing them that... Um, and I played them. I didn't analyze them. I was going for the raw visceral musical sense mm -hmm. and what that does uh, later after I've played them for years I would say gee that's what's he doing here and then I started to analyze it so the analytical process happened much much later but the music captivated you on on this uh the basic level of, like you would be a listener, right? The sitting yes, downstairs yes, in the pews, yes. and an organist would play Le Corbe Glorio, for example, and the listener would know any, wouldn't know anything about his musical style and language, how the piece is constructed, uh, but something, uh, you know, sticks, right? And, and st something stays for a long time, this feeling. And only after decades of, of doing that, mm -hmm. you, you were drawn to to look closer into how how it all came about. How and now that I've been looking closer, um, I'm fascinated by what he did. The um, the amount of reason and the amount of attention he puts to every little detail. And uh, being Roman Catholic myself, um, the connection with Roman Catholicism is. Um, just a complete experience. Of course, for the listeners, uh, his uh, early and middle period works are more accessible, probably, mm -hmm. than his later styles, uh, cycles, like like uh, 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 the Book of Saint, uh, Holy Sacrament, right, mm -hmm. or. Um, Holy Trinity mysteries. Uh, that's yeah, that's like the in the seventies. 
or even atheists. Uh, do you remember that famous uh, AGR convention in Detroit uh, when uh, when the work was premiered and yes. it was very hot inside and, and Messian was offered two choices, two two places, uh, with one with reverberant acoustics but limited uh, amount of uh, mutations mm -hmm. and another was uh, like a very dry place but with, you know, neo-baroque style organ with, with uh, thirds, fifths and even probably sevenths, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And he chose that and all the audience uh, in, in the building was sort of very, very packed and uh, It was hot. It was very hot, and we had a difficult time going through the, the piece, uh, through the... I could concert. feel it in the room. I could feel that... You were there? Yes. I okay. could feel that sense of, mm -hmm. when is this going to end? It was, it was, I think people were not ready for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you have, uh, you have to have certain uh, en environment, probably, and certain atmosphere in, in order to convey the mysteries behind uh, this reasoning uh, mm -hmm. of this musical language, too. So, uh, so it's interesting uh, uh, how this reasoning and uh, and uh, uh, sensitivity, uh, uh, intuition, right, uh, mm -hmm. are uh, developed or portrayed in in the nativité in detail from your presentation. Could you give us more? Um, I because the the writing was much bigger than the actual presentation. I had to really wean it down a bit. Uh, so I just really talked about the first opening three themes in uh, God Among Us, the last piece, mm -hmm. the ninth uh, work. And I took uh, a numeric uh, approach to it, the, his choice of certain numbers. Um, he chooses mode four that um, I believe if you look at the uh, scalar system of it, it's three, one, 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 three, one, one, one. Um, and he chooses to do that in retrograde, kind of descending down, and the idea of the um, second person of the Trinity really descending into human form. Yeah. Um, again, a very fascinating choice. To, to instead of, you know, the 311, three, uh, to do 3111, 3111. Um, that was one of the things that I really... And then just the, the choice of his... Um, the two talas that he chose, instead of, you know, many or one, he chose two, which was for him a good number to represent uh, humanity in mm -hmm. its most simplest, rawest, purest form. Mm -hmm. um, so that was some of the things I talked about uh, briefly on the, in the presentation. And those talas are, uh, are uh, uh, used interchangeably, right, uh, in the mm -hmm. piece, in the course of the piece. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to remind probably our listeners um, who don't know what tala is. Uh, tala is a rhythmical idea from the Hindu uh, system, right? Right. It, I guess they were re regional uh, uh, formulations of rhythm. Uh, and there were 120 of them mm -hmm. that were written down in the 13th century. And he found this document and became tremendously interested in them. Not that they're being used now in the music of India. Perhaps in some of the regional areas they're still, still using mm -hmm. some of them. But this is, you know, 13th century. But Messing was again taken by these and analyzed them and utilized them and really integrated them into his music and his style. And I think it was because he takes his lead rhythmically from nature. He has a tremendous love of nature. And there was a great quote that I found uh, in he, with an interview he did with Claude Samuel where he says, um, I have never experience an error in bird song, in melodic form or rhythm or the lighting of a landscape yes. I mean there is no error in nature It's and I think from that he took that and then with these talas his fascinate, fascination with bird songs of course is well known and he must have had great difficulties in finding those birds in the middle probably of the night going into the forests of different regions of the world and sitting there for hours probably with his tape recorder it's, it's, and uh, notate, really notating notating uh, on the spot probably yes. it's like a musical dictation whereas today we have all those tools uh, to record and then play back in a slower uh, 
maybe five times slower than it's required. I remember a couple of summers ago, I uh, I also tried to record a few bird songs myself in our summer cottage, and um, you know wanted to find out what kind of melodies are there because it's so fast and, and, and really difficult to notate and then recorded uh, transferred into the file f for editing you know uh, editing program software and voila I slowed down the speed but not the pitch level pitch level was intact and then I could hear something very human like Mm. Like a human voice, but but very strange. If I, if I, for example, uh, slow down too much, it's like extraterrestrial sounds. How interesting! Uh, but Messian didn't have all those technologies. No, no. he had to do this. He just by wrote hand. them down. Mm -hmm. Brilliant man. Brilliant. I wonder what he would do today with this, if if, if he had the, all this equipment. Wonderful. So I'm glad you you presented for for our international audience, right, at the conference? There was quite a collection of people there, yes, mm -hmm. from, all over, from all over. Did you happen to listen to other presentations? I did. Mm -hmm. and um, What stood out? Many of them were really very, very fine, uh, very interesting. There was one on uh, the work of Bill Evans uh, in his piece, piece, uh, that was really very, very interesting. I really enjoyed that. Um, were composers there that spoke directly about their musical style and mm -hmm. how they do things, and that was also very fascinating. Uh, coming to these conferences, going to the AGO, um, are such a shot of energy in the arm. I it, know what you mean. You feel like you're in the center of something, right? You feel like 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 musical world gathers right here and uh, uh, in this moment, and. Uh, cultural activity happens and last night uh, there were uh, was a concert right in the St. Yes. Casimir's church with with examples of it was it's 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 very well organized and mm -hmm. um, this is my first year in coming to it and I, I would love to return because it was um, for me a very good experience very enriching mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Would, would you be um, continuing your research in, on Messian too, or something else is on, in, on your mind now? Um, I have. Uh, there's. I'm, I'm. The part of this research that I did with uh, the intuition and um, uh, rational thought kind of led me to another area that I'd like to experiment a little bit more, um, and it includes Messian, but also other uh, composers. Mm -hmm. Well, interesting because uh, we have all all of we have this uh, binary brain system, right? Left and right side, and uh, we have to connect them all the time to to function properly in any probably activity. And uh, composers are not the exception in this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. You are uh, Mark, the first Carolyn player player that I have. Uh, personally talk to so hmm. could we talk a little bit uh, absolutely w about uh, this grand uh, I would say cousin of organ <laughs> well the, the, key is it the, the keyboard, keyboard is yeah. the, well, the actual console to play from uh, again it was on a very visceral level mm -hmm. um, I was studying my organ teacher in college was Robert Lodine Dr. Lodine wonderful man and a great great player and a good teacher and one day he said, oh, Mark, I'd like to show you the carillon at University of Chicago. And at that time, I was like, oh, do I have to go? And, okay. And so I went along kind of reticent to, to experience the instrument. So we went down to the University of Chicago. And to get to the carillon there, you have to kind of walk up a winding staircase and then walk across the ceiling of Rockefeller Chapel and then up another winding staircase. Uh, and I remember it like yesterday. Uh, he was seated at the bench, and it's a large instrument, 72 bells. It's really large. Mm -hmm. uh, has the second largest bourdon in uh, the North American continent. And he started to play. He's a very lanky guy. He was a very lanky man, six foot nine, I think. And I was standing behind him as he played. And what I heard, and watching him play, he finished. And I said, oh, Dr. Lodine, please please show me how to play this. And that was the beginning. 
Wonderful. So I studied with him, and then um, years later, the school uh, out of the school of University of Utrecht mm -hmm. um, did a master class in um, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Yes. Uh, where Marco Holst was the Caroliner there, Carolinist. She likes to be called Carolinist. And I played for them and, and went to the master classes, and, and they were wonderful people. There was Jacques Masson, I believe, and Todd Fair. And they both said, uh, why don't you come and study at the university? And I thought, well, you know, it's, it's, it would be nice. Anyway, they offered me a scholarship, and I went there, and I studied for a while. And that was like another huge shift in my understanding of the instrument and playing the instrument. Carolyn is very physical uh, activity, right? Carolyn playing. You have to use all your muscles, probably. Um, the organ playing is also quite quite uh, mm -hmm. physical, too, with all those feet moving, like in dancing. Uh, but I would say that... Uh, which one is dif more difficult, challenging for you? Organ or the carolyn? They're completely different. Completely. Is completely it a good different. workout when after you finished, for example, your playing? Both of them. Both with, them. The, with the organ and with the carolyn. Mm. It is. There's a lot of physical physicality. Physicality, yeah. yeah. So it's good for, for your help to keep moving the entire body, right? I like it. I mm -hmm. like it. Wonderful. Um, do you have to warm up a little bit before playing uh, those, uh, you know, grand uh, keys with, with entire palm? No, no. It's more, um, uh, at least now they're trying very hard to uh, codify the mm. instrument. So the console is the same everywhere. Mm. That's not the case in Europe. But in the United States, it's pretty similar. Yeah. So when many of the Carolines that I played in, um, in Holland and in the Netherlands were very, very um, different from each other. From Holland to uh, the, uh, the different places in Amsterdam and Amersfoort, they were really very different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's easier than it looks. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, uh, construction of, of the carillon is sort of uh, different from the organ because uh, the sound production is, of course, completely um, different. It's all mechanical. But mecha mechanical action is probably similar. Yep. Because all those uh, abstracts and. Uh, it's just with wires, with wires. these different tr trackers. Trackers, yeah. <clears throat> and then, depending on if they're connected to transmission bars or another system mm -hmm. of uh, springs and pools. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, when you see on campus of uh, some university, uh, they don't have um, mechanical carillon, but they have you know, digital carillon, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's sometimes a shame. bit of a shame, right? That they don't invest this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you mentioned in the Netherlands they have this big tradition and I think in Lithuania uh, now they just recently installed in Vilnius, Carolan too, in one of the churches in Jacobs and... Um, in so there are three now? Three, there's, Kaunas, there's Vilnius and Klaipeda. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Co uh, in Klaipeda, I, I believe... Uh, which one is the largest? I don't, I don't think... But there are only maybe three or five Carolyn players, Carolyn ah. uh, your nurse, right, mm -hmm. uh, in Lithuania, and they have their association, uh, so they they have those activities together. They get together and and uh, try to make the, their art more more known to the public, and they have uh, you know uh, public performances on Sunday. Uh, at noon, for example, uh, so that people around them. So, uh, the there were some. Hear. There were some composers at the um, conference mm -hmm. that, when they read that I played Carillon, they were like, "Oh, I have a piece for Carillon. Mm -hmm. I'd like to write something for Carillon." Mm -hmm. So that's that's a wonderful thing. I think. E exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So wonderful. Thank you so much, Mark, for being such a generous person and sharing your insights about the Messian's uh, um, cycle of plenty but in general about his uh, uh, output and also about your love for, for things like Carolyn. Uh, what else do you do? Uh, uh, do you, of course, you direct choir, right? I do. I'm the director of the chorus at the Marquette University. Mm -hmm. 
and the chamber choir there. Mm -hmm. And I teach some classes um, on the carol on, on um, the business of music, music appreciation. Um, so there are a lot of different things I do there. And I also have a regular job at a church as the director of their music. Okay, so uh, appreciation of music I can understand. This is for non-majors, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they all gather together in one room, specifically interested in knowing how, how they non-musicians can appreciate uh, music mm -hmm. on a deeper level. Uh, it's one of my favorite, favorite classes, probably classes. I, I really love it. Uh -huh. It's not uh, required for them, they choose, right? Mm -hmm. So they come, to, you know, voluntarily. They, so they want to they do want. What about the business course uh, of music uh, side? Um, uh, what do you teach there? I split the class in really two parts. The first part um, is I ask the question, what can you, with music, how can you make money? Mm -hmm. What it's all in this changing. Yes, it's all, all around uh, really a business sense mm -hmm. and a financial sense of what you know. Music as a product. What can you do with that? And we talk about music um, education. We talk about music therapy. Um, different possibilities of music that they would never have thought of before. The second half is what they usually come for, and that's. I have my band, I have my music, I have my, and how can I get that out to the world? So it's really a two-part thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then the final project is really um, sell me something. Okay. So you as the student to come up with something mm -hmm. and the class are the investors and sell me your product. And it's, it's, a good, it's a good experiment for them in a, in a small, small group environment to try and fail, uh, try things that don't work and learn from mistakes and move on. And the first year I taught it, the final project was really uh, two gentlemen came up with this product uh, of a weapon, using music as a weapon. Okay. Which I thought was very, is a little spooky, but very interesting. I've heard about bells being used as a, web, uh, as a, as a torture for torture, example. Torture is on one side of it, but mm -hmm. this is really as a, as a weapon. A weapon. And yeah. then there was another uh, woman who was using it, um, uh, how music can be used in erotic dance. Mm -hmm. And uh, not pornography, but more like erotic dancing. Mm -hmm. So it was a very interesting class, <laughs> the presentations, that they, well, things that they would come up with. Well, it's so important to teach these things and to uh, to try for the students uh, at the early age, uh, bec when, uh, whenever they are even not ready for, for this themselves, uh, they could uh, try experiment, uh, because when they graduate, the wild world is out there and they don't know what to do, right? After mm -hmm. maybe they have their degree and they uh, hope to go, to, you know, to the traditional path of um, academic or liturgical playing or teaching or, or performing but it's not easy to get to get appro approval for those positions right when you're teaching business side uh, basically they have to be they have to uh, choose themselves to create something and to share and to market mm -hmm. themselves right mm -hmm. it's very important these days yes because more and more and more people will be working as freelancers in this uh, new economy. Studies so wonderful, Mark. Uh, uh, I hope to hear more about your uh, future recent, uh, research uh, when you come back to, to the I next to conference. Back. I, if they will have me, I'd love to come back. But in the meantime, uh, perhaps could you direct our listeners uh, to, to a place online where they could say hello to you and support your, you and your work? Sure. I have uh, an email address that is probably the best way of, of contacting me, um, and that's my name, M-A-R-K dot K-O-N-E-W-K-O -E at Marquette, M-A-R-Q-U-E-T-T-E -E -E dot E-D-U. Okay. And that's probably the best way of reaching me, and then from there I can direct them to certain things. Um, I don't have a website that they could go to and see certain things, so it's more I would send them to different things. Do you have uh, like a social profile on LinkedIn or uh, 
or any of their... I, 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 not really. Mm -hmm. I have a Facebook account, but I think I have like seven friends. <laughs> Of course, people could uh, look at uh, Marquette's uh, website, find out, find your yes. music department there, and uh, find out about your activities there. Would you like me to insert the link uh, to Marquette University? Sure. Too? Sure. Okay, I will. I will do that so they have a better picture of your activities too. Wonderful, Mark. Thank you so much, and uh, uh, please stay in touch. Uh, maybe we'll meet again in another time on, on at this organ. Thank you for your generosity and for doing this. I appreciate. If you liked this conversation, I encourage you to visit my blog Secrets of Organ Playing at organduo.lt where you will find lots of insights, practical advice and training for every area of organ playing. You can subscribe to this blog for free to get your daily dose of inspiration and to be the first to know when any of my future podcasts roll out. I hope to help you reach your dreams in organ playing. I'm Vida Spinkavitus. Thanks for listening, and I'll catch you online 